Welcome to the Seller Roundtable e-commerce coaching and business strategies with Andy Arnott and Amy Wees. Hey, what's up everybody? This is Andy Arnott and Amy Wees. And this is Seller Roundtable number 62. And I'm super excited. I can't believe it's taken this long to have him on, but we have Kevin Dickinson on today. Thanks for coming on, Kevin. Cool. Glad to be here. Yeah, you've been you've been a, in, in before, but ne never the main event. So I'm excited to uh, be able to uh, get the backstory. And uh, you know, Kevin's a friend of Amy and, and mine, uh, so we 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 know a lot about Kevin. But I'm I'm sure we're going to learn more today, which is going to be fun. So I'm excited to uh, to get started. Awesome. Yes. Do it. All right. So Kevin, uh, you 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 kind of know this format because I think you you've seen it before, but. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we, we always like to edit it a little bit depending on, on who we're talking to, but, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your past, you know, like where you're born, where you live now, uh, things you did in the past, college, school, uh, family, kind of anything you want to, want to share up to, uh, you know, family and, and, uh, personal wise. Got it. Yeah. So I grew up in Southern California, still in Southern California, Huntington beach, kind of, uh, just a local surfer, just loves water sports. Um, I went to college mainly to be a software engineer and that's that was I was always into computers and just you know tinkering and getting stuff you know playing doom and all that and transitioned into a software engineer position so um I think I was a got in the software field for what 10 years and about uh three or four years ago maybe it's just over five years now I kind of started tinkering with like different products and and actually I got into like RC helicopters, you know, the ones that like go hundred miles an hour and then you like can kill yourself with them. And then I started making like a, um, like different tweaks to it and the different electronics of it. And, uh, kind of got a little bit deeper into the, you know, like, um, circuit board electronic aspect of that. And it's more of like hardware now, right? I've always thought like, Hey, it's how cool would it be to build a hardware software like robot or something. So anyways, that led to me opening a brand. It's a wearable, wearable electronics brand. And uh, it was just essentially on Etsy. It was just handmade. It wasn't even a brand. It was more of a hobby, right? And so I was still doing this. I'd have remote jobs during the, uh, you know, all hands meeting where they're going over their financials that really don't impact your job. I'd, I'd be sitting there tinkering with stuff with a soldering iron or whatever circuit boards. And, and uh, before you knew it, I started building a brand. Um, at this time, I was getting married. I've got now got two kids. So, of course, with having the surf lifestyle, you know, working from home, I want a serious work life balance. And uh, it soon became the case where my hobby started becoming a real business. And uh, over the last several months, I transitioned out of my software engineering full time job and into an entrepreneurial position. So, um, yeah, I, what else did you ask? Home, family, background. What else am I missing, Andy? I think well, you, uh, you, you, you got it all. Yeah, I think you covered everything, Kevin. So uh, get back to uh, when did you first learn about uh, e-commerce and Amazon? Kind of like your journey leading up to where you decided that, you know, maybe selling some stuff online would be a, a good idea or you wanted to, to dabble in that once you came up with kind of your initial idea. Yeah, so it actually came up about when I was reading the book for our work week. It was um, at the time I had invested in a, some other real estate and my, my realtor, who's a big investor in California, he, he said, hey, Kevin, I think that like your personality would really go well with this book called for our work week. And I was like, cool. I read, you know, I read it and just I loved it. Just the, you know, the fail fast, just move forward, get shit done, automate and just, you know, pound over to get things done. And so at that time is when I kind of like became less of a hobby and more of a business. And right around that time is when I started experimenting with different sales channels. And one of them, Amazon, it was just, you know, Etsy is such a small marketplace or it was, you know, five years ago. So I tinkered with Amazon and it seemed like just over the course of a couple of months, my sales just went, you know, four or 500%. And it, you know, all of a sudden I was running a real operation and had to, you know, then go write software to automate different areas of my business. And yeah, it was, it's really cool to see that sort of expansion. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to 
turn off the uh, comments they're distracting me <laughs> No worries. We'll uh, we'll let you know if some if 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 uh, somebody needs you. All right. So you were Kevin. You were telling us about your uh, your journey into uh, into Amazon, kind of how you got started. How you? Uh, I remember that you had said that you got into in, into Etsy early on, but it was just too small a marketplace. And then uh, you found out about Amazon. And uh, I guess now you're, you're kind of more, uh, you're diversifying and also trying to build your kind of your own channels, aren't you? Yeah, actually, uh, the main initiative for this year is to get into retail. And yeah, the protests and all of the store destruction is probably going to um, offset that a little bit. But I'm a little bit more long term thinking, you know, retail is not going to go anywhere, guys. I mean, yeah, sure. You know, e-commerce is going to be it's going to be growing during this, but people also are still going to be buying retail stores. So um, I'm sticking with that initiative. I'm digging my heels in, you know, I've considered pivoting, especially, you know, I sell products for events and, and concerts and events. So yeah, my business has been really impacted by COVID and the whole, you know, protests that we're getting right now. So um, it's a little bit disheartening, but, you know, again, it's, it, we, we've talked about it before where it's like, hey, if you have real passion in your business, it, that passion is what's gonna bring you through the hard times. And so again, it's, you know, it, it doesn't even phase me right now. It's going to come back. Yeah. It's an election year. So, you know, weird stuff's going on, but we'll get through it and the economy will pop back eventually. Yeah. It, it is crazy though. Right now it's like for retail, uh, you know, it's like the one, two punch, right? I mean, you know, first you had COVID now you have these, I just, man, my heart goes out to, to all these small businesses because totally. that's, who's you know, being affected greatly. Um, on the flip side, uh, you know, <laughs> as somebody who has protested a lot, even myself lately, I totally get the, uh, get the anger behind it and, and, uh, you know, get, uh, get what people are doing. It's unfortunate that, you know, there's others out there who are kind of stealing the spotlight with, uh, with negative negativity. Um, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we're, we're not a political show or, or, you know, so we'll, we'll try to stay away from that. We're going to try and keep happy because when I, start reading that stuff. It just makes me depressed um, <laughs> myself. So we're well, going to try to the, the, oh, we, go ahead. There's going to be no retailers that come out of this without scars, right? So the, the retailers that were struggling financially previously, yeah, they're going to go under, right? But, you know, Nordstrom's, I think they just closed like 19, 20 stores or something. They've got like still hundred left over. You know, that's a good sign. They're closing those stores to um, essentially cut the losses and just focus on their main set of stores. And so even Nordstrom's a healthy company like that. It's not going to go out to losses. So anyways, it's, it's interesting though, is, is I'd actually like to talk a little bit about why I'm pivoting. Um, Amazon has become such a competitive marketplace and there's like some serious um, problems that I see and some serious struggles, like even with like image suppression, you have certain products that like have certain lighting that you need to represent what's going on. Like I will play games. Amazon has a uh, image suppression algorithm, and you know, being a software engineer, I know exactly what, uh, you know, how the algorithm works, what they're doing, and I'm just fighting it. You know, trying to trick the algorithm, and it's just, it's so frustrating. It, it just inherently prevents me from, uh, from really getting the best product and and the best product photo, I mean product photo on the marketplace things like that, as well as intellectual property battles. Um, it's, God, it's so, it's gone through so much. I know I've shared this with you guys previously and privately, um, but I've, I've really gotten beaten down um, quite a bit by that. So it's pretty frustrating. And, and I, being myself, I want to have a competitive edge over my advantage, uh, over my competitors. So all my Chinese competitors or whatever, you know, it's gonna be a lot more difficult for them to get, to score a big deal with a large retailer. So. I see that as still as a main initiative that I'm going to dig my heels in and eventually get to. So, yeah, I know this is an Amazon seller podcast, but in reality, we've talked about this before that we yeah. should be a brand. We're not Amazon sellers. We're a freaking business. We're a brand. Yeah. Right. No, and, absolutely. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And, and uh, something interesting that's going on. I agree with you completely. Um, I know Kevin, I shared with you early on how, you know, before even brand registry and some of these other things were in place, we lost our entire, pretty much our entire Q4 or like 85% of our catalog was hijacked. Uh, yeah. So I completely, I mean, you're talking, we probably lost a hundred thousand in profit uh, in, in that quarter that year. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I 
completely get that. And it, it's extremely frustrating. On the flip side, you can't ignore Amazon. They are still the dominant player, at least in the US. Totally. What's interesting though, I don't know if you've read this article, um, but it sounds like because of all the issues and turmoil going on in China, uh, that uh, Amazon's now refocusing on India. So that's an interesting play. Now, it, it seems like they are now uh, mm. you know, going to start moving a lot of their relationships in terms of you know, courting manufacturers and sellers from India um, rather than China. It, it, it's, it's kind of a big uh, shift, which is going to be an interesting uh, play. And, and Megla is going to be doing a dance because you know, there's going to be tons of people coming to her to help for help uh, because yeah. she's gotten into that so early. Uh, but that's an interesting play. And I do think that, um, you know, with, with China, um, they're kind of shooting themselves in the foot in, in terms of, you know, this, this new uh, thing with Hong Kong and things like that. Um, you know, it's making it less um, a, as a business in the U S as somebody who is based in the U S who sells products in the U S it's going to be less uh, desirable for people to source from China now because, uh, yep. There's so much uncertainty and not only that, but, you know, now it's, it's more of a, a uh, rather than like, you know, a friendly relationship with a little bit of, uh, of unease. Now it's going more into uh, a lot of unease. So it, that, that's also going to be pretty interesting. But anyway. Yeah, I think that the, what's interesting though, is if you look at India, like the, the amount of products, the different types of products you get from India, you can't get everything, Right. Like you can go to Vietnam, you can get textiles from Vietnam, India, you can metals and woods and stuff. And, and I'm sure that, you know, I'm, I'm making a pretty generalized statement right now, but China still has like, their entire freaking nation is set up for manufacturing. So- And a know, lot of it, other countries get their materials yeah, to make their products exactly. from China. Every, I think it's gonna be kind of a longer leap for us to get out of China, but I do think that there is gonna be more diversification. And in terms of, brands that want to scale beyond Amazon into brick and mortar, a lot of the factories in India don't have the necessary certifications um, and requirements for them to be able to put their products on the shelf of a major retailer. Um, it, there's just a lot more, um, you know, kind of hoops to jump through. I definitely love your, your take on, on retail, Kevin. I'm doing the same thing this year. Um, I'm just taking a different uh, approach about it because a lot of the retailers recently, the bigger retailers, have opened up their e-commerce channels to sellers like us. Um, to brands like us. And that's a really great gateway into their regular shelves, right? Because all of the major retailers are now shifting their focus to their e-commerce channels. Um, and so, you know, just this last month, we applied for Walmart and um, Home Depot and um, Target as well. So there's a lot of really great e-commerce channels and now Facebook is opening up this new shop feature and there's just, there's a lot of opportunity in e-commerce beyond Amazon um, as well as e-commerce retail. Um, so I'm with you on that. I think that Amazon is a really strong sales channel but I think that all of us should be thinking about, okay, well, how do we diversify and how do we grow? I know a lot of people have been asking questions about, hey, should I go international, right? But before you go international, like think of how many platforms. I know Andy, even since COVID, he's been selling everywhere, right? He's been getting into print on demand. He's been selling on all these different platforms and um, kind of discovering new platforms and, you know, even us, we've been like on eBay, we've been selling stuff like crazy and we'd never sold like crazy on eBay before. So um, it's, it's been really fun to discover some of these new channels and, and see what's going on with that. Um, so I love, I love your goals and really good points there. And it's going to be interesting to see where, how sourcing turns out, right? Yeah, it's interesting that you say you're on those different platforms or you're applying for them. I think that's actually, I'm, I'm sort of torn because there's a couple different reasons. Number one, it's going to affect your sales story. So as you go to a, approach like, I don't know, uh, Nordstrom's in store and they ask, hey, where are you selling right now? If you just say Amazon, you know, okay, great, you're an Amazon seller. But if you said like, hey, we're on Target, Walmart, Amazon, Wayfair, right? Now it's a more interesting sales story. You're technically in, but you're not, you know, whether they'll ask the question if you're actually in the store or, you know, but then there's also another element to it, which is like, as you approach these retailers, 
or you know the easiest way for them to just do it's like hey we'll just send you to our or send you to our website that's a way for them to just like like kick you off the shelf like eh, you know we'll we'll talk to you you know you're not that important you'll just go on our website and then like you know how do you then move into the store and uh, you know are you really going to get the amount of traffic that you would in the store on an end cap to really do a, a real test and so I don't want to be like, essentially we talked about like, there's the, uh, when you're meeting a girl, there's like the friend zone, right? It's like the, you don't want to be in the friend zone, right? I don't know if that's the best analogy, but I feel like maybe that's what they might be doing. If you were to push target, you try and get in their store and they're like, Hey, we'll put you on com. It's like, dude, no, I want to be in your store, not in the friend zone. <laughs> Yeah, so real quick, guys, I wanted to jump on an Etsy and just tell people how much opportunity is there. So on one of my accounts, so on Etsy, you can have multiple accounts super easy, which I also love because you can have multiple brands uh, easily. But this account that I opened up in, um, let's see, what is the, the first order was April 3rd. So since April 3rd in revenue, this one account made 20 some thousand. Let me go back to the exact stats. But I mean, that's epic. Like for an e-commerce platform like this, that's, you know, used to be fairly small, 22, over 22 grand in revenue um, starting in April. So uh, what is it? June, April made. Yeah. So I mean, a little over two months. That's epic. Like that's, that's even better than I think than my start on Amazon. And are so, you mostly selling print on demand products on Etsy or are you selling your, a lot of your other products? So both. So I have, we have a handmade uh, brands um, like a uh, natural product brand. And then we also have like print on demand. So this account is a print on demand account. So that just gives you a, a little insight into, you know, how quickly the cool thing about print on demand is, you know, I I've got a, a an executive assistant and once I got this process down, I just pass it off to her. So, you know, like that's the cool thing about print on demand. And once it's up, you don't, you know, I'm not fulfilling it. I'm not, you know, it's just like a money machine. So uh, somebody recently uh, said that, you know, there was a quote, I can't remember who it was. Oh, it, it, it was one of my, uh, my coaches. Um, uh, one of my business coaches said that, uh, you know, he wants to, to, he loves businesses where things build things. Right. So in other words, like, the the second le level of automation right and that's to me where moving forward people that figure that out um you know fits perfectly into the four-hour work week where once you set something up it's it's a machine you you can let it loose and you have to check in on it it's of course not you know completely self-reliant but you know you can take yourself out of the business fairly quickly and it still makes money so yeah yeah pretty pretty epic so Kevin, when you got started with, with uh, e-commerce and Amazon, did you take any courses or like, how did you learn? You know, a lot of people, there's so many different stories. Like, did you just put your feet to the fire like I did, or did you take courses or kind of, how did you get started? Zero courses. Yeah. I remember seeing them like, Hey, 3000 bucks to go. It's like, no. <laughs> yeah. 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 But I do remember like the application process, like four or five years ago, it was such a pain like to get in and and I remember like, it took me like a month. I would just pull my hair out, the flat file, you know, there was no other way to do it other than through a flat file. You had to get approval for your flat file first and there was no documentation on it. I do remember that was frustrating, but I still didn't reach out. I, I just said, hey, I'm going to figure it out myself. I'm not going to pay somebody. Yeah. So besides the flat files and stuff like that, um, what year did you get started and what was your biggest challenge uh, in e-commerce when you got started? I think it was 2015. The biggest challenge um, definitely for me was the amount of SKUs that I had. And uh, so I had to write a lot of software to automate inventory processes, you know, generating POs for my multiple suppliers. You know, if you're trying to make a decision how much to reorder on a per SKU basis for 250 private label SKUs, like you can't sit there and do that calculation. It has to be automated, like forecasting. And so that was like a serious. Um, that was a serious thing that I really think that helped propel me forward. Um, and also having that many SKUs like cross selling on Amazon, it just helped really helped the brand build. Right. And I think at one point my number one um, contributing keyword was my brand name. And that's, that's huge because they just see it. I'm just all over the real estate on, on the, over there. Um, did I answer your question? What did you Yeah, ask? definitely. I think a lot of people, they want to scale, especially with, you know, your type of products you had a lot of cool options for many different types of, of, you could skew up really fast, right? You could do many variations yeah. and, but that's also a challenge and it's a challenge for a lot of people. I remember you, you talked about, you know, when you expanded into Europe, 
um, that was so hard because now you got all these languages and anytime you have extra SKUs, you know, for me, it's easy. I've got just a few SKUs. It's, it's not, it's yeah. not as, as tough to expand and to kind of follow that. But when you've got so many, I can see, and you really, your, your, um, your abilities as a software developer, being able to automate a lot of those processes, I think helped you and gave you an edge up over a lot of people that yeah. grew in SKUs and didn't have that ability to automate as easily. Would you say that is correct? You know, what's funny is, is that I've looked for solutions for this and I can't find solutions for what I'm doing. Um, it's, you know, I've been on, <clears throat> it's been on my mind for, you know, a couple of years now, like, Hey, can I package this and sell it and spin off? You know, do I want to distract and now own two businesses? So many, you know, Andy's, you know, the guy, right. He's got his own software seller, seller SEO, and he's done that, but I'm trying to focus, right. Um, on my brand and, you know, maybe one day that'll come about, but anyways, back to the software. What's so interesting is that as I actually go through different 3PL providers and as I like, you know, implement do, you know, either into Europe or into 3PL, um, I'm actually integrating my software with the 3PL providers, you know, warehouse inventory stock and all of their systems. I select the 3PL provider based on their technology and whether they can do that or not. So essentially, as I'm like changing all these, you know, I'm essentially as my business grows, I'm having to rewrite my software like over, <laughs> over and over again or, or expand upon it. And it's like, wow, you know, spending like a few days writing this new module, like what the hell do these other brands do? How are they doing? Are they, are they using, you know, these really expensive, was it Citrix or... There's some different accounting Maybe software. Maybe like the CRM, you know, the big CRMs or something like that. Salesforce and, and uh, there's a few accounting softwares that are like all in one inventory and counting solution. And uh, I looked at them, it's like a hundred grand a year. It's like, how are they doing this? Are they just doing it by hand? Are they even doing their accounting correctly? Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's crazy to think about that. And, and uh, um, yeah, I definitely think that it gave me a, a leg up for sure. And I still use it to this day. Um, yeah. That is awesome. So what about new products? I know how much you love innovation and coming up with new product ideas. And, you know, so tell us about your process for coming up with new product ideas. So believe it or not, Google images is such a valuable tool for me. Um, whether you're looking up like new trends. Um, so can I put it? I'm basically selling wearable electronic items. So if you like look up like, hey, different wearable accessories that people will wear and modifying it to, to fit my niche of what you know the wearable electronic is, just scrolling through Google images, finding like different necklaces or different men's products that what they glasses or hats or or different you know, or armband or something, those all give me ideas. Additionally, what I've started doing in the last year or so is um, I've joined all of the different, you know, probably like 40 or 50 different um, niches with on, on Facebook. And uh, so what it really does is it allows me to ingrain into their culture. I get to see how those people think. And it's like, hey, you know, this is interesting to me, this new product. And it's like, wow, I think I could do a spinoff of that on my brand. And it's, it's cool to see that, like, you almost get some free validation on that to see, like, people like that, you know? Um, but it's, it's different than just like, you know, scrolling through Pinterest or something, looking for ideas on building a new, some ideas on do it yourself crafts or whatever people are trying to build costumes or whatever. Um, but if you're on Facebook, it's something you're on every day. So it almost like gets you ingrained in their culture, even though I'm not necessarily in their culture. So, yeah, yeah. I love to do that too. in Reddit, I love Reddit in terms of yeah. like discussion boards and stuff like that. But I'm with you, man, like as many niches as you can join, as many Facebook groups as you can join and just like really get in there, get in the conversation okay. and, you know, see what, what people are talking about. And it's just really, once you kind of learn how to turn on that idea machine, you can just find ideas everywhere. Uh, the other day I was on Reddit and saw somebody talking about um, mimosas and like having a mimosa party in a neighborhood group. It was one of our local neighborhood groups. And like so many people commented on it. And then I went out and saw what was on the market. And clearly nobody that's selling products for mimosas on the market is doing any social listening because there was nothing. 
right? Yeah. So, and I'm not in that niche. So those of you who are like, hey, go for it. But it's, uh, it's just really cool to see there's so much opportunity that nobody's really taking advantage of. And a lot of people, they look for products first, right? And they're like, man, I don't know. Should I sell this product, this product, this product, instead of listening to what people want and then looking at the market yeah. and seeing where the opportunity is. So I love that you're using the images, thinking about, okay, well, what else do people wear? Oh, that would be, that would work really good. So once you find a new product and you've decided on it, tell us a little bit about your development process and how you go, you know, into um, developing and, and launching that product. So coming from doing 10 years of software development, there's a methodology called agile software development. And what it is, is essentially rapid prototyping. So if you think of like when they first designed Facebook, we'll spend the first week designing the Facebook application to just show your proto profile photo, right? You can see everybody's profile photo and you can scroll through them. That's all you can do is just see people. The next week, we add a, a button and it says add friend. You can add friends now. You have now friends. You can't delete them. You just add friends, right? And then the third week we go and we can implement delete friend, right? And you can get to see how that goes. And it's because software is so malleable, you can like really quickly change it and fast, quickly iterate on that. And uh, that's a little bit more difficult to do with product development, but believe it or not, like that's kind of been my mentality this whole time. Uh, so, you know, even does, I think Amy, you've talked about this before, like hand making a product and then just throwing in the, in the Amazon warehouse. Like, I think that's great. You don't even have to get a supplier yet. It's like a quick validation. What would be the next iteration after that? Well, maybe you, I don't know, get it 3d printed legit. And maybe you'd spend a comp, you know, 500 of them from some supplier in the U S and you'd, you know, break even on it. And then if those sell through, then you move to China and just find some Chinese supplier, just slap together a product. Maybe it doesn't need a mold, right? It's just a handmade yeah. product or a, a, a piece of wood that's cut. It's simple, right? You don't have to do mass, mass development or mass production on it. And then, you know, maybe you can, you know, implement a mold to make it more efficient so you can do it at scale now. Now that you've, now you've gone through three iterations now, now you can actually do a mold and you can get your, your multiplier down to where you need, to, need it to be. And, and that's so cool to be actually like get the instant gratification and make progress quickly. Rather than having to, you know, you know what happens if we got to make a mold, we got to go through the mold, the patent process. If you need a patent, then you got to negotiate with the supplier, get 3,000, 10,000 of them made, ship it by boat. And then finally, now, finally, we can make our first sale and realize that it sucks. <laughs> yeah, that's why Andy right? and I did the whole sourcing small masterclass thing, because, yeah. you know, it's if, if you have an idea for a product and you can source two components of that product and maybe you know in in the mastermind group the other day we did we were talking about this new product idea that we had developed based on market research and i gave the example of okay we can take component a and we can alter component b and just add a pocket to it and we can source 100 units of component a stick them inside that zipper pocket of component b and source 100 units and get it on the market asap right ready to ship alibaba easy to do right so I love that idea of just start. Don't let things get in your way. As you know, you know, I go to Hobby Lobby and I'll sew up 10 of something and I'll send it in because what is there stopping me, right? Why not get that feedback? Yeah, so, a lot of people don't realize that you can bundle even private label stuff. Like they're thinking about bundling existing products, but you can bundle, pri like I was looking at some, you know, you know, you, if you guys know me, I'm a big like survivalist, uh, you know, uh, those are the kinds of things that, that I've been into and, and I sell some of that. And so um, I was looking at, and this one was a local wholesaler, like not even from China, like somebody I found locally that I'm like, Hey, I can take these two things. They're selling like crazy on Amazon. I they're wholesale. So I, I like, I have minimal risk because I can pretty much order, you know, 10 or 20 at a time and my margins might not be as high, but my risk is also low. I can prove the concept. Then I can go direct to the manufacturer. So there's so many yeah. different ways to do that. And I feel like that, um, you know, some people think that like that the whole sourcing small thing is, is a joke. And oh, if you're serious, you need a thousand units and you, you gotta, if you stock out, you're going to be screwed. And I disagree with that. Like if that's the way you want to do it, I'm, I, you know, different strokes for different folks, but you know, I I've been doing this since 2011. I'm still here. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like that's, uh, those tactics have worked well. Now, if you want to try those great, if not, you want to do the thousand, 2000 at a time. Awesome. But 
to me, this is a great way to dip your toe in without be getting too risky. So speaking of scaling, <laughs> how did you scale, Kevin, when you got started? You know, you basically got started in your garage, right? You got started putting these products together and you were just selling them. And, you know, so tell us a little bit about how you scaled and when you even discovered that scaling was a thing for this business. Yeah. So essentially the entire business was bootstrapped literally from like $50 on the first purchase. And it's crazy to think about that. And, and, you know, being somebody who's never actually studied business, just studied software engineering, right? You start learning and picking up on trends and business trends as you build the business. And, and one of those trends specifically that I remember is like the cash flow of the business. It's so important, right? And so you start with like 50 bucks, right? You build some products, you'd maybe sell like 100, 150, 200 revenue. And so cool, now you got, I don't know, 100, 200 bucks in your account. Then you got to spend, you know, 150, you make 50 bucks profit, right? And, see, and then you sell 400, $500 of revenue. So what's happening is you're basically like, you know, spiking your bank account. It goes from 50 bucks to 150, down to 50 again, then 400, down to 70, 600, down to 100. And it's like this, you know, this jump and it's just the inventory game that we're playing. So one of the ways that you can deal with that as well is to get your multiplier up, right? So rather than just selling like, you know, you buy it for a dollar, sell it for, for four, we should be, you know, buying it for a dollar and selling it for 10, right? Mm -hmm. So the whole, you know, it's learning how to negotiate and learn with, suppliers that will really help your cash flow. You know, I didn't necessarily have those multipliers in the beginning. And so I was really affected by those peaks and valleys of my bank account. And that's, that's, uh, again, been in business for just over five years. So it's taken a long time to do it. Sure. You could have done it if you had an influx of cash and just, you know, injected 10 or 50 grand in your business. But, um, yeah, that has definitely been a huge learning experience. That's how I, I scaled, you know, essentially cash flow. But additionally, I think that one of the things, you know, I have a true brand. It's real, a real brand in a specific niche. It's identifiable. It's got, you know, essentially a, a cult, um, all the brand elements like matching, you know, marketing materials throughout everything. But additionally, all the products complement each other. So when, when you're wearing these wearable electronics, it's like, hey, you want to buy this other piece too to complement each other. So on Amazon, you know, all of my customers would purchase other customers who purchase this stuff. Not only, am I, not only am I on that row, I'm also on the row for sponsored products for this product, you know, and then also my supporting images. I say, hey, you can wear, also wear this other stuff too. So like just cross selling just really help just re you know, almost like flywheel the brand, right? <clears throat> Thanks for tuning in to part one of this episode. Join us every Tuesday at 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time for live Q&A and bonus content after the recording at sellerroundtable.com. Sponsored by the ultimate software tool for Amazon sales and growth, sellerseo.com and amazingathome.com.